they really loved your coming out story. And I think oh, you, you. Uh, talked about that a little bit on the aforementioned um, Crystal Kyle Friends podcast you were on. Do you want to uh, just talk a little bit about how that went? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it was a really, really great episode. Um, I was honored that Kyle wanted to talk about that because, you know, if you're a straight person, it doesn't necessarily matter to you. But I think that learning about the LGBTQ experience, it really is important. And I've kind of changed my opinion on this. I never wanted to be like the gay dude that talks about gay politics on my gay YouTube channel or my political YouTube channel. But I feel like as time goes on, it really is necessary to really uh, cement, you know, support for LGBTQ plus people, because I feel like over the years, one thing that's been really clear to me is that once you win support, that really is something that you have to continue to foster. Otherwise, it could go away. And this is this is true, not just for like queer rights, but like if we got Medicare for all, uh, which I hope that happens in my lifetime, but like assuming we got Medicare for all immediately, it would have to be a huge collective effort to defend Medicare for all because we know that it'd be, you know, there'd be attacks on it to privatize portions of it and whatnot. And the same is true for queer rights, even like within my own family, like people who accepted me ended up going backwards and then accepting me again. So this is something that you you have to constantly build. And I think that talking about my experience has 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 been at least illuminating to people and, and i've seen what one thing that i really like is people would say like okay well i don't agree with mike's politics but i think this story is really powerful and it makes you know it makes me understand the gay experience more uh and that that's all i want right because like i don't want to be a representative of all gay people you know gays incorporated because i'm just a normal human being you know i don't want to be that person who's like kind of an asshole and it's like well a gay person was an asshole to me so fuck gay people it's hard to be that representative right but just to like get people to understand the things that gay people have to deal with um, is really important, I think. And sure, it's it's identity politics and whatnot. And I don't like that we have to kind of go back and rehash these fights that we've already had. But unfortunately, we live in this late stage capitalist nightmare to where, you know, Republicans and Democrats don't want to have conversations about education and healthcare, So they're going to continue to target marginalized communities as a distraction. And before I thought, well, once we win, we win. But no, that's not actually true. So we have to go back, rehab these fights, and try to continue to move forward, even if we're going to kind of keep circling back to the same shit that we should have already won. So hopefully yeah. that's kind of a long-winded way of answering that. But No, you, you actually said something that, you know, kind of I, I think is important. You know, you, you talked about how, you know, Kyle and like, you know, regular straight guys, you know, sometimes, you know, they get a little uncomfy when you talk about the whole coming out experience or, you know, just not super interested, not putting it at the mm -hmm. forefront of the discourse. But then you said something else that, you know, I think I, I frankly, you know, should have probably done a better job foreseeing because I was definitely in the camp of people who was like, wait, when I saw, especially the anti-trans hysteria, which we'll get into, I'm sure. Uh, when I started mm -hmm. seeing all that manifest again, the, the anti-gay, the groomer stuff, I was just like, I was like, what in the fuck? Like, what is happening? Right. You know, and I'm a straight guy. I live in a bubble, right? I live in Kansas City, Missouri. But I was like, didn't we talk about this in like 2009? Like, wasn't I yeah. like, weren't, weren't, weren't we having these discussions in fifth grade where it was like, oh, yeah, the kid whose parents are really religious and hates gay people. Like, we need to talk to him and like fucking like, yeah, help him get over the fucking hump. Otherwise, we're just going to call him a piece of shit forever if he doesn't. You know what I mean? I thought that yeah. happened like 10 years ago. And then, you know, you just see the de-evolution in uh, the way that people, I don't know, understand or relate to, or I don't know what the correct nomenclature would be, but it just seems like mm. massive societal regression. Yeah, and, and that's what honestly is shocking to me. And like, that's part of me having like this gay privilege because compared to like trans people, it's an entirely different experience, you know, culturally, you know. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's crazy how effective um, right wing uh, marketing is right because this whole gay predator myth was one of the hugest things that I was battling when I was coming out and it was not just me I mean like the generations before me were battling that too but all you have to do is tweak the language a little bit you know instead of pedophile it's groomer and you kind of prime people to think about the same thing so you're not saying explicitly gay people are pedophiles but when you put groomer in someone's head they come to that conclusion themselves and they think oh well if they're grooming of course they're pedophiles now they're completely misrepresenting the word grooming but they don't have to represent it to accomplish what they want to accomplish um so yeah it's it's hard because like I, i've had people in my in my family and social circle who are the most accepting people ever but then they'll just kind of drop a fox news talking point and i'll just you know i'll do a double take it's like hang on i mean 
you're, are you saying that I'm like a groomer around my nieces and nephews? I would fucking kill anyone if they tried to hurt my nieces and nephews. Well, are you serious? Like that you know me though. You know, you know, this is just a stereotype. How could you how could you say that? And then I had to like basically have this conversation and re help them relearn the things that they learned or help them unlearn the bad habits that they recently picked up. Even if like they don't watch Fox News, they could hear it from one of their friends who might be apolitical, but heard, heard it from, you know, a conservative friend. So these things spread like wildfire. And the thing that really put it into the perspective uh, for me was how popular the don't say gay bill was in Florida. I mean, more Democrats support it than not. So that goes to show you that things can regress really, really quickly. And whenever I see like straight people really embracing, you know, gay people and fighting, that is just, that's the best thing ever, right? Because they don't have to care, but they do. And and that's like so valuable to me. Yeah, no, I, I exactly mirror your thoughts and what Zach said too, where, you know, I, I am a straight guy myself, much to the surprise of some people. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, I always kind of thought, you know how people said like under Obama, like, oh, we live in like a post-racial America now. And obviously that was bullshit. Right. Uh, well, I, I did kind of think, you know, in a sense that we were living in like a post-homophobia America, because mm -hmm. after gay marriage was legalized, I mean, obviously, I know homophobia existed, but I was like, mm -hmm. oh, this is like relegated to, you know, really like, you know, kind of rural areas, maybe, or people that do not have a lot of experience. Like, this isn't a mainstream thing anymore. I thought we were so beyond that. And what's really shocked me about this recent resurgence of kind of uh, uh, moral panic surrounding the LGBT community is that it's not just fringe voices. It's actually mm -hmm. like literally the most prominent members of the right wing media. Here's a tweet from Ben Shapiro. This looks like uh, <laughs> this is right out of like the 1980s. Uh, Disney works to push a not at all secret gay agenda and seeks to add queerness to its programming. And obviously, you know, fuck Disney. I don't give a fuck about corporate America. Um, but mm -hmm. having the uh, a very minor and mild depiction of a same-sex relationship in a movie is not a, a gay agenda. It's literally just the most basic, you know, storytelling, representation, whatever you want to call it. There's nothing sinister about it. It's not some secret kind of agenda or anything. Again, and this is Ben Shapiro, probably the most popular online person on the right. Another one that I thought was particularly hilarious. Uh, here's Blair White, who, by the way, is a <laughs> trans woman herself, uh, who says, I'll never forgive the LGBT community for allowing the slippery slope argument I grew hearing up from Christian conservatives to actually come true. And obviously nothing has changed. There has been no, you know, slippery slope and the gay community, the trans community, it's no different than it was. It's just that now the right wing is hyping it up and creating this hysteria, which is right out of their playbook. I mean, they always do this. They pick a minority or a disenfranchised community. I mean, it seems like in 2016, around that era, it was like illegal immigrants and, and uh, Hispanic people, stuff like that. It seems like now they're trying to gin up a, a panic around LGBT people. Uh, but again, I thought that was particularly fucking crazy another one that i saw uh, just the other night was um candace owens saying parents who take their children to drag queen story hour are underqualified to have children they should have their children taken away from them and again what i find you know the most blatantly hypocritical about all this stuff is that a couple months ago uh, people like Candace Owens, people like Ben Shapiro, all these fucking right wing idiots were talking about how, oh, the government should not infringe on parents' <laughs> rights to raise their kids the way they want. And all this propaganda in schools, a critical race theory, you know, parents need to reassert control over their children and over their communities. The government should not be involved at all. And here she is saying that the government should take people's kids away if they go to a drag queen story hour, which, by the way, there's nothing inherently sexual about a drag queen. Uh, anyway, I just find this all completely insane and totally unexpected i did not see this you know anti-gay panic happening but here we are yeah and to the extent that anti-gay panic became a thing again um to have it really land that i think is is you know the wake-up call for a lot of folks and it's just honestly if i'm being perfectly 100 percent honest people like blair white and uh dave rubin and christian walker like the gay conservatives who weaponize their identities to spread homophobia i don't think that they realize and i tweeted about this too um they'll never be one of the good ones we're both going into the same blender like they, they want to put you into a blender they want to put me into a blender so they think that they can like by using all the same arguments and talking points that they are just like oh well i'm helping like maybe Blair White is deluded en enough to think that, well, if I say transphobic things, then they'll think, OK, well, this is one normal trans person who's saying what, you know, they also think. Therefore, maybe that 
cultivates acceptance, but it doesn't work that way. Like you absolutely never cultivate acceptance by embracing ignitry, uh, bigotry and ignorance. You, uh, you cultivate acceptance by fighting and challenging ignorance. Um, and, and so these people, the thing is that they have money. Right. They're getting money to say these things. You know, you get clicks if you're the trans person who shits on trans people like Dave Rubin. You know, he's the gay guy who goes on Fox News and says, well, as a gay person, this is not homophobic. And he gets a lot of money for that. That's where the cash is. So but the problem that I have with that is and, and perhaps the reason why I hate them more than anyone else is because they're the most effective because using your own identity against your community is very, very persuasive. Uh, because, you know, it, in the same way that somebody like my sister can point to, hey, I have a gay brother. So therefore, this is what I know about them. The opposite can happen, tr too. You know, so like somebody on Fox who's watching Fox News can say, well, I saw this trans woman who said, yeah, these kids are getting groomed. And it's really powerful. It's it's a huge propaganda tool. So, yeah, it's 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 frustrating. And I appreciate, you know, people who are acknowledging it and and pushing back against it, because currently, like we have a Democratic Party who is just letting it slide. Uh, I mean, Joe Biden, to his credit, signed an executive order that does some things, but I mean, you, you need legislation, right? But like a couple of weeks ago, I, uh, I I read this article. I can't remember who who wrote it, but it was about how the Democratic Party, people like Tim Ryan, Hakeem Jeffries, their response to the groomer talk was, oh, that's so stupid. Nobody believes them. And it's like, hello, like, have you seen the polls? Like, you have to have some sort of pushback. Otherwise, you know, Republicans are going to set the agenda and they absolutely have dominated. So, yeah, I, I honestly think that this probably sets like queer people back a decade, if, well, if only. Yeah. Yeah. Not to cut you off from Mike. I'm sorry. I, I just sure. meant to add that one of the things that just blew my mind when I saw that tweet that Gavin pulled up is the number one response to Blair White is just a person saying like, oh, I, I, I think that the gay people would be so much better off if they just never fought for their rights in the first place. Right. So I think it was the, the actual translation was like it read like, Oh, uh, what if somebody had said, fine, asshole, I'll just buy my cake somewhere else. The gay movement would. Yeah, I feel like if someone just said, mm -hmm. fine, asshole, I'll get my wedding cake somewhere else that we'd be in a slightly better place today, which is just the most like backwards, archaic logic. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, yeah, maybe if we'd never had the civil rights movement, like black people would be in a better place in America. Like maybe if we just never, uh, you know, uh, like done X, Y or Z for any marginalized group like uh, this would be. Uh, you know, better for them because then they would have just shut the fuck up and done what we wanted them to. And that would have made me happy anyway. Right. Like this is just the yeah. most brain dead kind of analysis. And I feel like this shit is really popular. It's just like exactly what you were saying. It's like I want somebody with this identity uh, to basically satisfy every uh, bullshit narrative about them. Uh, and, and then just like that makes me OK with those people now. So I'm not prejudiced. Right. It's like I'm OK with a trans person if they spend 23 hours and 30 minutes every single day telling you that trans people are bad. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Or I'm OK with a gay guy if they're going to be like, oh, I don't care that you think my life is invalid. And uh, like when Dave Rubin was talking to Ben Shapiro and Ben Shapiro was like, I'm not going to your fucking wedding. And he was like, no, I respect you. And it's like, are you fucking kidding me, man? You're going to do this to yourself. But. You know, uh, I, I don't know. It, that, that just blew my mind when I was looking at that. And, I, and, and, and all of these things, they just compound to be like, holy shit, like we're like like we're not doing well as a left. Yeah. And, and you know what what we've always been pushing for is just a basic level of human tolerance. And the reason why that tweet probably like stood out to you so much is because it's it's fundamentally intolerant. Right. I mean, to just force gay people to accept that some businesses won't serve them is I don't think that people really understand the implications of that. Most, you know, uh, gay people probably don't live in cities. A lot of them live in rural areas. And even if you live in a more liberal area, as I did, and there's laws against discrimination, that doesn't necessarily mean that people will find ways to subvert those laws. For example, like when me and my husband were looking for places to rent um, right beforehand, a month before that, my friend who has a female same sex partner, she's bisexual, um, got turned down specifically because she was gay. And it's not like the, you know, the landlord said, well, I don't want to rent to two lesbians. But he said, oh, wait, it's two women who are roommates. And, you know, they, you, they could put two and two together. And so that like horrified me. And, you know, looking for venues for like a wedding. If you're a gay person, a lot of them are like churches or like these old religious couples that have like farms and shit like that. So you have to think, OK, I just got to not go there because even if they're, it's illegal for them to say I won't do a venue for a gay couple, the like amount of mental agony to deal with um, somebody saying no, not if you're gay, not two men 
it's it, it like it leaves a lasting mark on you like there was like relatively close to where i live there were four masked men with guns they had like ars and um they had signs that said gays are not welcome you know gays go away um one of them said something about putting gays to death like it didn't say put all gays to death but it just said like something of that nature like you know death penalty or something capital punishment and it's like you know this thing does it, like you can't just let it roll off your shoulders that easily like i try to but it kind of eats away at you where it's like holy shit there are people like really close to me that want to kill me just because you know I, i'm gay and they don't they probably don't know about me but still the thought is really ominous so you know the thought of like going into a restaurant um and then saying nope not gonna serve you or trying to get a cake and they say nope um a lot of people don't realize that there's not other options you know you can't just go to another restaurant like some people live in very rural areas and you shouldn't have to like if you're gonna have a business you have to follow the law you know and you shouldn't be able to discriminate against people that's just fundamentally intolerant you know if you were to say oh well you have a maga hat get the fuck out of my restaurant it's not the same thing because that's not like an immutable characteristic but they would have a problem with that but the, you know these conservatives can't empathize with other human beings and think oh, okay i guess i wouldn't like that if that happened to me or if it happened to my daughter or son so yeah it's just it, what we're asking for is basic tolerance. And what's so horrifying is that we're not getting that. We're getting intolerance. You know, we're getting this coordinated effort by the right to make queer people go back into the closet, you know, to stop trans people from transitioning. And it's it's really a horrifying sign, you know, for, for what's to come. Yeah, and it has, you know, very real world impacts to this rhetoric. Some people, and I'd like to get your response to this, but some people um, try to reduce all of this kind of conversation just down to, oh, this is just the culture war, you know, this is just right. the distraction from the real issues. You're falling for the for the uh, distraction, like, don't talk about this, you know, it's not productive, etc. Um, but if we don't talk about it, if we don't push back on these dangerous ideas and these bigoted talking points, then it actually has, you know, very real world implications for LGBT uh, people, I'm trying to find it here. Yeah, um, in Scotland, uh, obviously the UK is wow. like the turf capital of the world, so it's not necessarily surprising, unfortunate. But uh, trans hate crimes are up 87. Um, percent I wonder why. You know, I, I wonder mm -hmm. fucking why. Uh, again, it's because of all of this transphobic um, kind of turfy talking points that, unfortunately, especially do thrive in the UK, seemingly. So, again, I'd like to hear your response, Mike, as someone who's obviously part of the LGBT community. Uh, what's your response to people? Because I hear this all the time, unfortunately, uh, even from people that I otherwise agree with on other issues. That you know, this is all just the culture war. You know, why are we talking about this? You're, we need to be focusing on more important things. Yeah, I, I think that you hit it, you know, you hit the nail on the head, Gavin, because like culture, it, it affects people's lives in a really concrete way. So sure, you know, it's it's a culture issue, but the impact that this has, you know, it can't be ignored. Right. And and I get like, I understand the sentiment because like, I don't want to fucking talk about this forever. I want to move on and fight for education, Medicare for all. But the problem is if you just ignore it, then it breaks up the coalition. And this is why it's so it's so savvy for the right to do this, right? Because you have a lot of lefties who understandably don't want to keep talking about culture war or identity politics things. But when you do that, you leave so many people behind and the movement inevitably becomes fractured. So for example, like Medicare for all, like I can't, I don't think I've ever met a trans person who isn't in favor of Medicare for all. Because, you know, uh, if you want to transition, that's really fucking expensive. And, you know, insurance doesn't cover all that. So these are people who are part of the movement. But if you see transphobia and you think, OK, let's just ignore this and focus on these bread and butter issues, which is what Democrats are doing right now, literally. And they're not even focusing on dinner table issues, but they say they are. Right. But I mean, like if you just like ignore and you don't go back and fight these issues again, then every other issue is going to be less likely of advancing because the movement becomes fractured. You know, it's, it's one of these, it's, it's the oldest debate that the left has been having about like class reductionist versus like, you know, um, the, the alternative, right. Where you, where you support everything. I'm, I'm blanking on the name right now, but like there has to be a really good mixture because if you say, well, you know what, defunding the police is really divisive. And so I don't want to, I don't want to talk about that then, you know, you leave behind a lot of black and brown people who don't want to fight with you on other issues who are allies. So even if they still want to fight for Medicare for all, 
that that lack of like solidarity, you know, it, it just it gets it spreads like a disease. So the right is really smart to focus on these culture war issues because that's all that they have. If they actually had a conversation with us about like healthcare, they'd lose 10 times out of 10. So by trying to gin up fear by the reactionaries and really like Americans in general, we, we kind of are conditioned to have more reactionary mindset just because America culturally is a lot more conservative than other countries, comparatively speaking. But, you know, it, it's easy to find new arguments um, or find new ways to repackage old arguments, you know, it, and it, it works, which is why they do it. I mean, the whole trans panic thing, it's based off of, you know, the gay man panic, you know, the same conversation about, you know, oh, well, this this man can just put on a wig and say he's a woman and go into a bathroom and prey on on girls. I mean, the same thing was true about gay men. I remember the conversations that I'd hear my family have about, well, gay men are predators. They can go into a bathroom, prey on little boys. This is disgusting. They shouldn't be in that same bathroom. And then, you know, it, with the with the sports issue, the same thing was true when, you know, there was integration in the U.S., oh, well, we can't have these black basketball players play with white basketball players because they're biologically advantaged compared to the whites. So the whites won't have a chance. And we're seeing the same thing with trans people. And uh, like, I always go back to, okay, if you don't understand it, it's a subjective experience. If you don't get all elements of it, okay. But we're asking for a basic level of tolerance, just tolerance, not, you know, um, not not anything other than that. Like accepting, acceptance would be great. But tolerance is really the ideal because that just means I may not understand or agree, but I'm allowing you to live. But we're in the situation to where trans people literally can't live. Like you're in, if you're in Texas and you have a gender, uh, a transgender kid and you seek out gender affirming care, now you're being investigated as a child abuser. You know, there are Matt Walsh, for example, who has an anti trans propaganda uh, documentary that's probably more hysterical than Reefer Madness. Um, he is now admitting, he had a tweet about this, that even adults shouldn't be able to transition. So, you know, it's not, we're not even to the point of tolerance being a possibility. Now we have to fight for basic tolerance again and just letting queer people live, you know, the whole live and let live mantra. That's really important. So, yeah, sorry, I kind of went on a different tangent, but. No, don't apologize. Yeah, I think that, I think it's, I mean, I, th I think that's the spot on. Yeah. And also, I would just add that, you know, when it comes to some of the real what I would consider culture war issues, stuff like CRT or like right. you know, on, on the left, sometimes there obviously are people that go too far, like the the people that love to hand rig about like cultural appropriation all day, stuff like mm -hmm. that, or the whole Latinx stuff like, I, yeah, obviously, that stuff can be a little bit annoying. Uh, but that's different than the literal blatant homophobia and advocacy for regressive policies that we're seeing now come from the right wing. You know, it's one thing to to get distracted by these dumb kind of like social justice warrior causes. It's another thing to literally stick up for the basic human rights of our fellow American citizens. Like that's not mm -hmm. engaging in the culture war to me. That's just like, yeah, in the same way that I would argue for uh, integration of black and white people, I would argue that gay people and trans people should have the same rights as anyone else. Like that's the most obvious thing ever. And it does really bother me when that all just gets grouped into this like culture war, uh, identity politics, you know, bucket. I just think it's dumb and reductive and it's not true. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And to to say, like, I, I don't really blame people for using the term culture war. Uh, I, I'll use it myself just because colloquially, that's what kind of people acknowledge as these social issues. But it, it's so much more than culture, like it affects people in such a profound way. Like, I can't tell you how many emails I've gotten from uh, queer people who are contemplating suicide um, and just feel like, I, you know, if, if society doesn't accept me, then what's the point? My family rejected me. You know, it's it's really difficult. And thankfully, there's been success stories where, you know, somebody a couple of years ago wrote to me saying, I'm not going to be here much longer. And then they write back two years later after I've had conversations with them saying, I'm doing really great. I'm in a good place and I'm helping other queer people. But that's not always going to be the story. You know, that's not always going to be the norm. So like this culture war, it really eats away at you. And especially like just from my perspective, I kind of feel like I have a responsibility to cover these things on my show because, you know, I'm a queer person. So I've got to advocate for queer people. Um, but it just like, holy shit, the depression that you get just when you see again and again, oh, it's another story of how you're groomers. And it really, it, it ends up having an effect on you. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's it's more than culture and it has a real concrete impact on people in particular, you know, um, young people, because that's who I really care about, because queer adults, we've we've been, you know, um, we have thicker skin. But when you're a vulnerable young person, it's really hard 
uh, really hard. So one thing that I'll say to straight allies that you can do is if you have like a local um, queer youth resource center, if you volunteer or donate to them, um, don't donate to, to these national organizations. But if you can like spend time there, that will have the biggest uh, impact, especially now, because these centers are going to be targets for like, oh, these are grooming facilities. Yeah. But these these resources like uh, these centers provide resources that literally save lives. So if you're like a trans kid and your parents kick you out, they house you. You know what I mean? So um, it's really important that people support these things. The uh, resource center that I volunteered at in Portland had a brick thrown through their uh, window like all the time because they had the queer flag. So you have to kind of like broadcast that this is a safe space for queer people. But at the same time, they just inherently are targets, especially now. So that's one thing that I'll say, like if somebody like sees this and they want to find some way to help, find a queer uh, youth center and whatever you can do, ask them. That really, it's it's huge. I can't even describe it. Yeah, well, th that's super important. Thank you so much for you know bringing that perspective to our show today, Mike. I think it's really, yeah. again, important that we talk about this stuff and not just talk about it, but that we call out this you know clearly concerted campaign of bigotry that the right wing is waging, um, this moral panic that they're trying to gin up uh, as they always do, you know, with any given um, disenfranchised or minority community. This time, unfortunately, it's the LGBT community. And yeah, it's incumbent on all of us as commentators or lefties with any sort of a profile to call this out in no uncertain terms for what it is. Uh, and, and frankly, I've been really disappointed by the fact that I haven't seen enough people do that when, again, mm -hmm. it's just so fucking clear as day what's happening. Um, and it seems like such a fucking baseline thing to be able to call it out, but I guess not for everyone.